me, there's not as many people here this evening that we need. We, we have a very full agenda, but I promised Mr. Bradley that we get the word out. And the Section 3 requirements were, he has spoken about these things in the past several years. And due to the complexity of this, this rule, he has not been able to get much traction because people frankly don't understand it. And I don't have to admit, the first time that I heard this, I was, you know, man, I, I, I need another day to figure this thing out because it was confusing, very, very confusing. But I think now we have made some inroads about this, and I would like for him to give him about 15 minutes, he's been here a long time, maybe 20 minutes if he needed, to talk about uh, Section 3. And we're not going to have a back and forth on it, but at least this will get it out to the public. And to, I think Mr. Shannon is somewhat familiar with it, but it wouldn't hurt to know a little bit more about it. And then our folks will come back and actually look at some of these meetings and they will know more about it. So, Earl, if you will. Thank you, Councilman. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. I know y'all have been sitting here a long time. You're ready to go like yesterday. So, I'm going to make it real brief. We uh, were given that a lot of time. Some of you have been familiar with it. Basically, the Section 3 tool is a Federal, federal, a federal regulation code that was established back in 1968 that allows and determines how contracts are awarded to minorities. Now, Mr. Martin Jewell hit a, a very valid point in a discussion pertaining to uh, UPS and those particular dollars. So, it, what we want you to be with is this. Yes, we're speaking of the uh, Section 32, which is a procurement process, but we're addressing all procurement processes because that's where all roads lead to. Every issue you address has dealt with some type of discretionary issue pertaining to awarding contracts. So we're engaging you to look at a possibly a, uh, a Section 3 or a procurement oversight committee that can do what the city auditor had recommended, which was to revise the particular procedures, whether it's from the housing authority or whether it's from um, procurement services, or whether it's either Section 74, which is the original public procurement. So I want to just lay that out, um, and we thank those that have stayed here, maybe by choice, maybe, maybe it might not, but we want to at least lay the foundation that the point we're making is all roads lead to procurement, and the issue that you've heard today, and you've been hearing all along, is how the contracts have been awarded. And throughout everything you've heard, it has always been certain discretionary powers. And we uh, want to again, and I sit down and let Mr. Henry always come up and close it out in reference to the, the, the history, in reference to the law, uh, because that's where we're at now. We have two suits already, and then dealing with the procurement process. So we're engaging the Land and Use Committee, and we thank you so much, Mr. Collins, for uh, going out of the box, getting a third party attorney to look at the codes of federal regulations, because as you stated, we're so accustomed to doing it the way that it's been done since 1968 that we did not know and really look at that it was being done wrong in reference to the uh, court of the law. So uh, again, we thank you for this opportunity to share these couple of minutes to those that have been able to be blessed by choice or by might. And um, again, take this with you. All roads lead to procurement, and all the discussions you've ever had, whether it's the jail, whether it's the school, have always been coming back to discretionary powers and all that is controlled by city council because you under the Virginia Public Procurement Act 2.24301 is the governing body that designates the housing authority and economic community development to do these development programs. They have to always come back to you in order to appropriate or get that. So you are that governing body. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Brown so he can let you know how all of the laws and regulations pull this together to where it's Section 3 2 is the law. But again, all roads lead to procurement, and we just need to look at the policies and revise the message. And one thing I mentioned too, uh, working with Earl on Section 3, the fact that we've talked to RRHA, and they are fully on board with the implementation of Section 3, which is vitally important. That's a big, big start. So if we can just continue that line, I know that Ms. Shane and you are aware of this lot more so than anybody. So we're, you know, we're working on, of course, our current education task force is abundantly aware and we'll be championing this issue as well. So, you know, thank you very much. And, and we need to be at the table because it's not enough for the housing authority to uh, do their uh, procedures and then say we fixed it. We need to be able to be there to work with them. Yes, exactly. Good evening, 
counts the person. <coughs> the only thing I would like to add is for oh, you need a station. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is H.O. Bruce Brown, I'm with Graphic Development. I'm here to speak on behalf of the <coughs> Section 3 tool. And I don't have a lot to add, but I would like to point out that sometimes when you when people hear uh, the word federal government, they become reluctant or want to deal with it because they feel that they might uh, be more uh, more restrictive or something may change <clears throat> as far as how they conduct business. Now procurement is very important because procurement deals with how contracts are issued. But if you deal with the section, if you look at section three and why is it really why it was initially established, <clears throat> Congress some time ago Excuse me, of course. Congress of time ago had the interest of the people at heart when he started dealing with certain types of legislation. There are three things I want to point out. Number one, Congress wanted to, through public housing programs, they wanted to improve living conditions. Number two, they wanted to fund slum, slum, <coughs> slum areas, they wanted to improve slum areas, get rid of them. And then they wanted to do urban renewal projects. Well, one way of doing that is by passing legislation. And this legislation was done through the Section 3 tool. Now, the Section 3 tool can enhance local procurement policies. It doesn't take anything away from what you do locally. I have to keep in mind that if federal funds are received, or federal funds are involved, you got a section three tool is a part of the process. You cannot, uh, states still can develop their own procurement policies, but any policies that the state or perhaps uh, municipalities develop must be consistent with the federal law and cannot conflict with the federal law. Section three is not an impediment to the procurement process. Section three is an enhancement to the procurement process, and it's unfortunate that oftentimes municipalities and the states don't take advantage of it because there are opportunities for employment and economic opportunities through the section three tools. And the only thing we're trying to do is get council to give capital consideration to the section three tool because it can benefit of the city of Richmond and the people of Richmond. Any questions for Mr. Brown? I appreciate both gentlemen coming down to review this with I think that uh, <clears throat> I think it's important. I, you know, I really, really do. I think we got the we got the Democrats on this side, the Republicans on this side. Republicans don't care about the people and the Democrats want to give it all away. But, but you know, the fact of the matter is that the middle line is teach people how to, to earn money. In other words, they, they basically don't like being on welfare any, any more than other people like to be on welfare. And if we can, can enhance the, the training abilities, I think that's down the middle of the road. I think that's what we need to do. And I appreciate you guys. Remember, you've been at it forever. Beat this drum and notice you as well, and Preston Court knows you've been an uh, advocate of this, and I think we just need to push it further and further and further and keep saying the same message over and over and over, and, and we'll finally get through it. We are getting through it. We just need to get through it on, on a large scale. And I think that the Bond Secure Project will work to help the minority businesses. I really, really do. The Redskins thing, I think that's going to be a big, big help. You know, Big Bond Secure is, is known for. For, for working with minority businesses. So, so we look forward to that. We're going to hold them to that, to that word, you know, or you got to hold to the word, anyway. So, but anyhow, I appreciate you guys coming down here. It's, it's, been, it's been a long evening, and I appreciate your endurance, you know. And I wish you had more people here, but I think that they were making a point. You, you have, this is a public hearing, and you have a chance to, to say what you need to say. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, last thing that we have on the agenda.